It's funny. I keep. Great. Well, hello and welcome to this morning's episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and this is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. And today, I am so excited, of course, regular contributor Emily Kornheiser, who's one of three reps from the town of Brattleboro, has joined us today. But we're, we're also being joined by Christine Hallquist, who is the executive director of the Vermont Community Broadband Board, also known as VCBB. Um, which is a five member board uh, created as part of the Legislation Act 71. And this board supports the work of communication union districts or CUDs. And if you uh, have internet at home, which you probably do if you're watching us right now, um, you're probably like, what are all those things, all those acronyms, what do they mean? Well, for those of us who live in rural communities, <laughs> They mean very important things because this is the part of the state that is working on helping local communities and their communication union districts bring broadband to or, or fiber to uh, some people call it the last mile, some people call it underserved communities. Either way, those of us without internet and as someone who's moving to one of those towns this week, yay CUDs. <laughs> So Christine, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, would love quickly if you could kind of update people on um, the state's been working on creating the communication union districts for a while, but um, could you just quickly tell us like what they are for folks who may not know um, and what their, what their goal is? Yeah. And, I, and this is actually uh, unique in the United States. Um, we're, you know, the legislature has done some amazing work here in terms of this legislation. Uh, what communication union districts are, are essentially multiple towns can join together uh, it, to form what's called a municipal communications district to get all the advantages of mu municipal borrowing and others, as well as put their heads together. Uh, to, you know, it's better, it's better when you get multiple towns working together to, to achieve a goal of getting everybody connected. And uh, what's it? What's great is today, 208 of Vermont's two, you know, 250 something towns are now part of communication districts. And there's, uh, looks like we'll have about 215 after the election because more are joining. And at that point, all the towns that, that have underserved will pretty much be uh, part of communication unit districts. Uh, the rest of the towns are being covered uh, uh, through other means, but, What's great about this is if we tried to do this at the statewide level, it would take forever because it's, you know, this is a huge undertaking uh, building infrastructure like this. In fact, you know, one of the, in one of the uh, meetings with the governor, uh, one of the, his uh, administration folks said, this is the largest infrastructure for, uh, project Vermont ever has undertaken. Of course, since the uh, introduction of electricity, I will add, um, so, and this is very much like the introduction of electricity. So if you, you know, if you try to do it at statewide level, it never happened because it's because just because of the bureaucracies that exist within a state. Um, and if you try to do it at a town level, it would probably take forever and may not happen as well because every town is, you know, different. Uh, and it's hard to get some, uh, the towns to, to, uh, to, to all work under the same uh, design. So this has really been a great model um, and it's really helped us to accelerate uh, this infrastructure build. Thank you, Christine. And Emily, um, so part of what the CUDs are doing, if I understand it correctly, is basically communities are banding together so they can kind of fill in the gaps of where commercial um, internet companies haven't gone yet. Mm -hmm. um, now, in this neck of the woods, we have DV Fiber, which has 24 member towns, um, and they happily just hired their first executive director this summer, which is exciting. Now, on your, where you're sitting in the table as a representative, 
what are some of the challenges you're hearing from, from towns and how are CUDs kind of meeting those challenges? Well, I think um, in addition to sort of this idea of the deeply underserved communities, um, which it's, I think it's more obvious to, with say a Whitingham, um, <laughs> that there's just a clear market failure there, right? There was not a strong enough profit incentive and so an enough, a high enough return on investment. And so the private sector never went. Um, there have been a lot of attempts by both the federal government and Vermont over the years to just sort of incentivize the private sector to go to these communities. And generally that involved like pouring a lot of money down the drain um, and having those communities not be served. There's a few places where that's been successful historically. Um, Rockingham actually has incredible fiber um, because of an initiative like that, a federal initiative like that, but beyond that, not so much. Um, and then in communities that are lightly served, I'll say, which my area of Brattleboro, sort of the rural West Brattleboro area of Brattleboro and a lot of other towns in Vermont, are yeah, one of those two. Term, which I know is not yep. the technical term. I'm sure there's a technical term for it. But <laughs> what that means is um, that we are subject to a monopoly market that Vermont has absolutely no ability to hold accountable or to regulate because the feds have put in place some fairly strong controls um, driven by the telecommunications private sector to restrict state governments from doing any regulatory work with these corporations. And so when I have constituents call me on the very regular about <laughs> really horrific conditions that they're experiencing with this business that they're giving their money to, um, I can't do anything at all because we have no regulatory control. Mm -hmm. And so in addition to sort of serving the last mile, like Whitingham, the edges of Whitingham, this is also an opportunity to provide Vermonters with an alternative that is built by their communities and that is able to be regulated at the state level, which is really pretty incredible. This mechanism of the municipality, the communications unit district is something um, that we actually use pretty regularly in Vermont law. So school districts are considered municipalities um, in mm -hmm. the same sort of technical way. Um, waste districts have, are as well, waste, aren't they? Yes, exactly. Yep. We have waste districts are also considered municipalities. And so it's this sort of structure of governance that is made up by member towns that, like Christine said, has sort of bonding ability and debt ability and all kinds of other things. And so this is really just like such an incredible opportunity for like Vermonters to take the challenge by the horns, solve it. It's been driven up until this point by some really just like incredibly dynamic volunteers who have mm -hmm. just gone, yeah. into, you know, full speed ahead. And now is um, we've been able to put the resources on the table for these communications union districts for them to start to hire, you know, full time staff. We've been lucky enough to have Christine join the board um, as director in order to really move these things along. And so that's a real like the switch to the professionalization of this work while still maintaining community ownership is a really huge opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really hopeful. The Deerfield Valley Communications Unit District um, serves really like all of Southern Wyndham County. So Brattleboro is part of it as well for people who are listening mm -hmm. that sort of started in the Wilmington area. Yeah. Yeah, let me, let me uh, uh, before we go, yes. uh, I, wa I wanna parse a couple things apart that Emily has discussed just to really uh, get folks to understand. You know, Perfect. the, the um, first, if you look at the underserved areas of Vermont today, you know, they, there's just not a business case for it. So, so if you, you know, if you look at what we average um, in this, the areas we're looking at today are eight, eight passings per mile. So it's, even if you fully fund this with grants, you've still got a very marginal business case. You know, what we show is that anytime you get four, less than four paying customers per mile, even if you gave the network away, it couldn't support the operation and maintenance costs. So we have this really challenge between affordability and getting these people served. And our first goal is to get the folks served. Um, 
So, you know, if we look at eight passings per mile, you need to have at least half of those customers take the service and be able to pay. Um, so it's, it's still a very marginal business case. And, it, and that's where we have to be very careful in, in how we move forward with these business cases. Mm -hmm. And then the other part is I, I want to talk about performance. You know, performance, one of the things we have, you know, I'm, I'm a very active member of the State Broadband Leaders Network of working with the National Telecommunication in the Infrastructure Administration, as well as the uh, Federal Communications Commission. And one of the things a group of us are pushing is to, as, and I think, I'm, Emily, I'm so glad you brought up the point about regulation. You know, I, I was the CEO of an electric utility. And I will tell you from a power restoration standpoint, telecommunications is even more important than electricity today. Yet we don't regulate it. And we don't even have the authority, even if we, you know, if we haven't solved the regulation problem because the FCC does not give us the authority to do ongoing performance monitoring at an address level. Hmm. So, you know, what, uh, what we, uh, this is the, uh, the way things work with FCC is the uh, telecom providers self-report, and that self-reporting is laden with a lot of errors, of course, it's kind of like having the fox watch the hen house, right? <laughs> um, and then on top of that, you could take, you know, I, I want, I'm going to make the statement that if it's not fiber, it's not broadband, period, you know, and I can even, I, I won't get into the physics here, but the, uh, the, but I'm going to use wireless as an example. Okay. You know, you can you could take a test during uh, stick season, which is right now after the leaves fall off the tree, and get a very nice signal going to the customer, and and say you've got you know 100 by 100 performance, 100 megabits up, 100 megabits down. Um, mm -hmm. But then as soon as the leaves get on the tree, it it uh, goes away. So uh, you know this is still an issue that's important to keep working. Uh, uh, and, and keep focused on is and Chris, getting, Christine, getting our listeners um, down here. A lot of our listeners are down here in Wyndham County where it is not stick season yet. We are still in foliage. And <laughs> I will tell you the wet leaves, which is what we are pretty much experiencing yeah. all through this area right now is the very worst we can have for. Um, yeah. And, and so that's, that's great. You're talking about that, Emily, because the, 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 this is classic, right? The, the regulations and the reporting don't match the customer experience. Right? Mm -mm. And what we want to do is get our, our, our regulations and our reporting and our monitoring to match the customer experience. We're a long ways from that. Yeah. It's, it's been interesting for me. Um, so folks have probably heard I'm in the process of moving from West Armerston back to the family nest in, in Whitingham. And so in Dummerston, I, I, when I signed up for internet, I was whining because I only had the choice of like two, which then went down to one. Okay. Well, in Whitingham, I called five companies. One of them was just so expensive, I couldn't afford it. The other one did serve my house, but the bandwidth was so low that the salesperson talked me out of getting the service. They're like, no, just don't even bother. Um, <laughs> which was quite a thing. Um, and I finally have a service coming. We'll see in a couple of weeks if it works. But yeah, to go through that many companies and I have a job, obviously this is not the paid job, but you know, this happens because of the internet, this, this show. Um, a lot of my remote work happens from the internet. And I was sitting there going like, hmm, wonder how I'm going to do my work. And I had just kind of assumed it wouldn't be that. I knew it would be hard to find uh, internet in Whitingham. I didn't know it was going to be that hard. And it's not just doing your work that matters. It's, you know, most phones, the copper lines of landlines are not maintained in our communities anymore. And yeah. so most people's access to even phone service comes through the internet. And that's how they call 911 when they need to, right? Mm -hmm. That's how you get your electricity, like all of it. That's um, safety let me, relies on this service. Let and me I just wanna, add to why, why, why fiber is the answer. What you just described, Emily, I'll go into the physics standpoint. You know, with copper, the copper is, is essentially rotting in the ground. That's what copper does. You know, copper interacts with the soils and it, and it rots over time. 
It takes a long time, but we're at the end of, we're clearly beyond the end of life of our copper infrastructure. And cable systems also, because they're mechanical and metals, you know, they use metals, copper and, and uh, aluminum and others for the conductivity, they degrade over time. Fiber does not degrade over time because it's glass. Really? It's, I didn't know that. That's really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that either. Yeah. It, glass and it's fused. You know, it's so we're using in the electric oh, utility so cool. industry, we're using fiber from the early 70s to this day, you know, and still it functions perfectly. So so it's uh, you know, it's if you look at your 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 electric wires as an example, and of course, forgive my bias because you know I'm a recovering engineer. CEO of electric utility. So I look at the world through, the, through these lenses. But the, um, you know, you look at that wire that runs across your, your, that provides power to your house. You know, we change the poles and we change everything else, but we don't have to change the wire, right? That wire kind of lasts a long time because it's sitting in the air. It, it's, it sits up in the air and it's either aluminum or copper. And, and you know, they, it, I, I don't want to give you the impression that these wires last for you know, 10,000 years, because we don't know that yet. But certainly we know that this fiber has gone for at least 50 plus years and we haven't seen uh, any any reason that that needs to be replaced. That's really cool. The other thing- That I'm, is so cool. Thank you, Christine. And I'm looking for anyone who's watching this on the video, I'm actually like, was looking at my power lines as Christine was talking about it, which was nice. Um, I wanna also touch on sort of, um, there's this idea that was talked about a lot um, in the context of communication union districts, and that's the donut and the donut hole. And so I want to mm. just talk about that for a minute. So, um, Christine, you mentioned that you need sort of like a certain amount of households per mile, and underneath that, the you know the business case is very challenging. And so my understanding is what happens, and sort of how we'll wind up serving the whole state by the end. And so we'll have that real power of the regulatory tools that we have with this um, above and beyond just sort of the last mile um, piece is that when you're sort of in the donut part, not the donut hole, you're going to have a lot more people who want to buy into the service because it's the only service available or it's like clearly far and above the best service available. And then once you sort of bring those customers online, which is sort of the last mile customers, you get to go into the donut hole where people might be a little bit slower to connect because if I have two choices, like, you know, it takes a lot of effort to like change your, to change any of those things. You have to make lots of phone calls and be patient and switch your billing and all that stuff. Um, but then when we get more and more customers into the donut hole where there's a much denser population area who are less expensive for the provider to serve, then we sort of are able to build out the business case further, but it's a longer ramp to sort of bring those customers on. And so- Yeah, well, yeah, I wanna be careful with that because that what's happening here, I, I believe that in the next five years, all Vermonters are gonna to get to fiber optic internet because if you're on a cable system today or on wireless, and I can't talk about who the providers are, but the providers are gonna come there and overbuild with fiber because fiber is, the least expensive from a long-term investment. So the private carriers, once you're over 20 passings per mile, they're going to replace all that system anyway. But once you're on fiber, you're probably not going to switch um, for two. So you, I, I don't see that. I do not see the CUDs improving their business case because the problem with C now here's, I, I, I can't, I don't even know if we have time to go into the complexity of all the issues. But I'll use one telecom provider as an example. You know, it, if when you're trying to serve these areas, you need to get an average revenue of $90 per customer in order to pay for the network with the Ooh. amount of grant funding we have um, in order to make the business case work. Now, that's the same for private telecom providers. It's just, you know, they, they just, but one of the things that we have is we have some, the private telecom providers are getting subsidized to the point of 30, 30 bucks or so. So their, uh, their average revenue only needs to be 60. So they can actually provide lower prices than the CODs can. Hmm. Now, maybe 20 years out, that can shift because of 
than you know paying off the debt service. But mm -hmm. it's certainly not going to happen in the next ten years. And sorry, Christine, just to put the those numbers in context, is that ninety dollars a month? Ninety dollars. Ninety dollars a month is what the okay. average revenue needs to be. That's about what it's working out to the state. And that's okay. with 60% grant funding. If we get to 100% grant funding, we could drive that down probably to about $70. Hmm. Oh, but it's not going to go below $70. What's hmm. that? It's not going to go below $70. Yeah. And again, people, you know, I've really, we've got, you know, we've, we've got uh, another staff member who's been really now digging into the numbers and getting to understand it. But we really need to educate folks that you can't, you can't put a business together that you lose money on, right? And even if we have zero out, there's no profit here. You know, this is the problem that we've been facing forever here. It, and that's really the challenge. The challenge is you've got to pay for the network. And there are operations and maintenance costs and customer care costs that that are ongoing, likely to grow, but the debt service costs should come down. But will we, you know, based on today's numbers, will we get below 70? We can't, because then mm. you start losing money every month. And so the mediocre um, service provision for low-income folks that some of the larger, larger corporations provide. Um, that I think grew a little bit during the early years, the early phase of the pandemic. Um, is that subsidized by federal USF funds? Is that subsidized by state USF funds? And how does that sort of fit into affordability for the communications union districts? Well, the reason that the, uh, so that's funded through, uh, the, you know, through their profits and service charge, what they do, you know, if you look at, once you get over 20, passings per mile and you get to the higher densities, you, you know, it's, it, you, you start to get, drive the costs way down and it's a direct correlation between density and, and cost. Okay. So for example, we're saying eight customers per mile, you need $70. But if you double that, you, you know, you get down to roughly half, you only need 35 or 40 bucks, right? Oh, so okay. the large carriers, because of their density, and I, and I don't want to give the impression it's a direct correlation, but I'm mm -hmm. using that as an example. Mm -hmm. What you, you know, so they, because they have the density, they're able to offer uh, lower costs, you know, and, and no matter what you do, everything we pay is socialized, right? So you socialize, their costs are socialized, meaning if you, meaning that if you, if you, you know, the, the more dense areas cover some of their losses and the less dense areas. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it works. You know, electricity, I taught, you know, we, we come up with one standard rate. You know, when I was the CEO of my electric co-op, you know, the, the Heinsberg area had 40, 40, uh, 40 passings, 40 paying customers per mile. And up in the Northeast Kingdom, it was three or four. And we were, you know, and the, I remember one meeting with some folks, I won't say what town, but a wealthy mm -hmm. town saying, Oh, just, you know, spend, spend $5 million here. <laughs> no, because now, you, you know, now you're, that you're, you're, we have to think about those people in the, up in the Northeast Kingdom, you know, that's, that's, mm -hmm. it's so, so it's, it, it is all about, you know, how we socialize these costs. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So just as a time check, um, and we have just about uh, four minutes before the end of this uh, first half. And I just have to laugh because I don't know if this was true for you, Christine or Emily, but my, you guys started to freeze and I got the, your internet is unstable message from Zoom. And it's like, <clears throat> without fail, when we talk about internet on this show, something goes wonky. Um, yeah, of course. So I don't know if the internet bots are listening or what. But uh, yeah, we have, we still scored a hundred on um, funky internet during an internet conversation. Um, Emily, what do you think as, as we go into our break, what do you think uh, is key for listeners to understand right now? Well, I think we've um, really sort of explored how, what will need to happen to bring prices down to be um, possible for Vermonters. I think we've talked a lot about both the promise in terms of um, good service and sort of a strong regulatory capacity, 
and how great it is to have communities banding together to do this themselves um, with some professional expertise. I think that's sort of a best practice for how Vermont could operate. And then mm -hmm. after the break, I would love to talk a little bit about sort of like timeline and process and how this has sort of looked mm. in parts of the state. Because one of the both um, opportunities and challenges in this Vermont style, each region does it themselves their own way, means that like sometimes it doesn't work as well in some places in the state than other places. And like, what does that mean in terms of like equal access across the state? So I'd love to talk about that more after the break. Fantastic. And Christine, any thoughts you want to leave listeners with before we hear from some underwriters? Oh, no, I think that Emily's got uh, going in the in exact correct direction. We got to talk about how, you know, how fast we're going to serve, what some of the challenges are, where the various CUDs are in terms of, of, of that timeline. That would be great. Um, so wonderful. And um, but before we hear from underwriters on the Vermont Community Broadband Board's website, um, is there a list of all the different CUDs? So if someone's wondering which one they belong to, they could look that up. Where can yes, they find more information? Yep, they they can go to the uh, they, they have to go to the Vermont Public Service Department website, and we're like the first thing that shows up there. But, but I also, the easiest thing is just, if you just Google, this is what I do. I just Google communication union districts. And since we're the only play, state in the country that has that, you'll, you'll it, the, your first hit will be right to the site. Fantastic. Thank you, Christine. So everybody hang tight. The Vermont, the Montpelier happy hour will return after we hear from some of our underwriters here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. We'll be right back. Great. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. If you're just joining us, I am your host, Olga Peters, and I'm speaking with Christine Hallquist, who is the executive director of the Vermont Community Broadband Board. I am also speaking with regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser. And Emily, what do we need to remind people of? The views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests, respectively, and not the station, nor their employers, nor friends, nor pets, nor anyone else that they come near or speak through. <laughs> Thank you. Added a um, new twist on that one at the end. There. Yes, I, yeah. I like that. Just Thank a little you. zing. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, opinion through osmosis. So we have been talking, Christine, about community union districts or CUDs and, and bringing a fiber to fiber internet to um, underserved communities. Curious, have any of these CUDs um, actually started building out fiber yet? Like what kind of timelines are we looking at for some of these communities? Yes, actually, I'm excited to say, you know, NEK Broadband is actually hooked up an entire town at this point, and they're continuing to move forward. Wow. CB, CB fiber is moving forward with construction. You know, so a number of maple broadband has just got into construction. So the, the uh, CDs in, are in various places. And uh, even, even if we talk about starting, some of the other CDs are also gonna finish up quicker. You know, those that have, those that have developed partnerships with uh, some of the major carriers like uh, Fidium will get, you know, they'll, they'll get things built out in two years um, where others might take longer as they build the business case. So it's, you know, it's, so I'll kind of go into uh, some of the details around the different progress that the different CUDs are making. And like, you know, it's, it's, it's a complicated issue, right? Just like town select boards, each CUD has a board. Some boards are able to move faster than others. Um, and, and the CUDs have various levels of executive director expertise, some uh, ex, you know, with, with, with the high level of skills and others that, that you know, uh, may be a, a different point in their path. But I will tell you, I am so impressed with the quality of the executive directors that were hired. I'm actually so impressed with the quality of people we've been able to hire. It actually, I can almost say it blows my mind that there are so many people who are mission focused because 
what, you know, I left the private industry. I was in the high, one of the highest paid industries, the electric utility industry. I look at the pay scale for the, for the not-for-profit sector and state employees. And I said, oh, how are we going to get qualified individuals? We have some really top-notch individuals. Um, and I, I'm so pleased that there are mission-focused people that, that are still, you know, wanting to do what's right and wanting to do good. So uh, we, uh, so anyway, with that said, I don't want to give the impression that anybody's, you know, not qualified to do this job. <laughs> we, we've got really extremely qualified people, which is why I have so much optimism that we're going to get this done, because I believe collective will. Humans can do anything. You know, we just get in our own way sometimes. Um, so, so anyway, so if I, yeah. So if I look at this. Uh, Will you back up before you talk about where they are now? I would love to learn more about sort of how some of them formed um, and what that, before they hired staff, like what that actually looked like, because I find it to be just extraordinary. Well, it's interesting because, you know, before the governor asked me to do this job, I was actually the executive director of two communication unions, Eddie K. Broadbent and Lamoille. So I was one of the... Uh, earliest executive directors hired. So I had the opportunity to really experience this growth. And if you look at, um, I'll, I'll use NEK Broadband as an example, because they hired me first. Uh, they were uh, they were only like, you know, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but maybe somewhere 15 or 16 towns at the time. And I think like anything else, you know, the, the, the uh, legislature set up these CUDs, but you know, in the beginning it was, a, it was slow. It was a slow roll. Because, you know, there was a lot of skepticism that the CUDs, you know, this is going to be a passing thing. You know, there's always skepticism in government. You know, I, I worked with uh, the towns of the Northeast Kingdom and uh, some of the towns don't, you know, they don't even trust government. So, so the idea that we put a government institution together to solve this problem was met with a healthy level of skepticism by many of the towns. But I think you know, like anything else, as you continue, people see progress and see people moving forward. Um, and they see that the CUDs, wait a minute, these CUDs, I think they're going to work. Towns started to join on. And it, so it really became a ground, you know, this, so I'm talking uh, 2020 when they formed, a couple towns took the bold map step of signing on. When you look at uh, serving Vermonters with broadband, there's a lot of energized volunteers out there. And so these volunteers, I will tell you, you know, in the case of uh, NEK broadband, you know, we had Kristen Fountain and um, our, our, our chair, uh, whose name's escaped me at this point, but we're, they were very motivated. And it was such a pleasure working with these uh, folks who are that motivated. And, and, and had a lot of depth. So that's what kind of created the momentum to the point where today, NEK Broadband has 57 towns. You know, and so it really in the last year, uh, year, you know, 2000, I would say 2000, late 2021, early 2022, that there was a groundswell of towns that signed out. And now we even have towns in Jinkton County that are looking to form in this next election. So the town has to take a vote. Each town has a, a primary and an alternate represented on the board. So you think about Eddie K. Broadband, he's a 57 people on his governing board. Uh, but it's very, it's a really ni nice model for how you can get community representation. There's over 400 volunteers working on CDs throughout the state um, right now. And, and they're representing their towns and working, uh, working very hard to get this done. So. Does that answer your question, Emily? Did I kind of give enough of the history? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, um, so my memory of it happening down here is that various towns voted as a community to join the sort of collective communications unit district. They appointed members to serve, often folks from their select boards. Those folks got together. They did a lot of planning work. They did some preliminary business planning um, before your office was created, um, which was fairly recently. Both the public service department helped them. And then there was also a few nonprofits around the state that were helping them. Um, so I know Corey, which is um, the organization that Matt Dunn founded, did a lot of technical assistance to communication union districts. I know that 
um, down here, our regional development corporation stepped in to do a little bit of technical assistance. And we had sort of preliminary grant funding that we appropriated for folks to um, hire some consultants to do some of that planning. And that then sort of like brought people to the next level so that when we moved more money into it, folks could start hiring staff and start sort of really planning build out. Yeah, so, the, I, do, I do want to plug the Vermont Community Foundation too. They were very helpful in providing funding for these startups. A, a number of um, the member towns, at least in DV Fiber, I wouldn't be surprised if this is true across the state, um, actually started from uh, I think they were usually called internet committees. So at the town level, there was just volunteers working together saying, how do we solve this? And it, what it impressed me about DV Fiber is that it grew out of efforts that started even before CUDs were a thing. Um, and that just amazes me at how long some people have been working at this. Yes, that's a great point. And, you know, CV Fiber, I remember during my uh, gubernatorial run, I met with them back in 2018. They were a, a, a small group of committed folks trying to make this happen in central Vermont. And of course, we can't, I would be neglectful if I did not mention EC Fiber, who really, you know, this was this whole uh, CUD uh, model came from, you know, they were, you know, a, over a decade ago started uh, banding together to build networks. Um, so it's, and the EC Fiber is a great example of a success that you can have by banding together uh, to accomplish a goal. And so it sounds to me, Christine, like a lot of these CUDs are at different places in, in the process. Um, is there anything on the horizon as far as next steps um, that, that these CUDs will be working on? Is there like new legislation coming down the pike? Are there new initiatives from the board, um, new funding, anything like that? That um... Yes, let me talk about funding. Um, and let me just say, first of all, you know, that we've got, uh, you know, we're, our goal, we've got a, still got a couple communication districts that need to, to, to get to construction. So our goal is to get everybody to construction first. Um, and that's, you know, that's the laser focus right now of the CUDs is to get to construction and start the construction process going. That said, we've got to move this fragile business plans forward into solid business plans. Um, so we're, you know, we're at the VCBB level, we're talking about what do we need to do to help these CUDs, you know, really take a look at the next level of depth in their business planning and how they're going to address some of the riskier financial issues that exist in those plans. Um, now, the good news is, you know, with we we're hoping there's plenty of grant funding. So let me just hit the funding so far. Um, you know, we estimate. You know, first of all, I'll, I'll say I always want to say that, you know, if we wanted to build fiber to every address in Vermont through grant funds, it would be over 1.2 billion dollars. The good news is we've got private telecom carriers that are going to cover a large part of Vermont that allows us to use our grant funds to focus on the underserved. We estimate, based on last year's numbers, that uh, it'll take about $550 million to get uh, those all the underserved served. Now, the plan, of course, is to get to, the minimum plan was to get to 60% equity funding so they go to the bond market. Get, that gets back to that earlier $90 number. With 60%, you get, need to get $90 per customer. But, but it does get you funded so that you can, you know, we provide grant funding for 60%. And the other 40%, they go to the market and they pay debt service charges and all that. Now, our, our goal at the BCBB is now, what do we got to do to get that to 100% grant funding? So let me tell you what we're doing on that area, in that area. So today, the, between the legislature, the governor has committed uh, $245 million towards that $550 million cost. Um, we we know we're going to get a minimum of $100 million through what's called the, the uh, Infra uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA. Um, so that no, $100 million... No, just, sorry, I just want to clarify for folks. So that first um, tranche of money you were talking about from the state was um, a lot of that was from the first two COVID bills that came through. And then this next 
money that you're talking about, the IIJA, is straight federal money that like really doesn't go through the um, state appropriations process very much. Well, yeah, the 200, the actual 245 million actually came from ARPA capital, hundred yeah. million dollars in and, and ARPA uh, state funds. So it came, it's your know, federal federal feed through through the state. Uh, so yeah, it's not h impacting our state, you know, our, our state tax uh, mm -hmm. challenges, of course. Um, so we expect another hundred million. That gets to three hundred forty-five million. That gets to us our sixty percent of the equity level, but we want to go beyond that. So we just worked with, and I and I I gotta say it's it's another unique Vermont thing that just happened. We you know we managed to to uh, uh, we managed to um, get the major telecom providers and the CUDs to cooperate together to submit a hundred and fourteen million dollar grant to uh, for a middle competitive middle mile program, and we're we're hopeful that we we can get that additional funding. It's and actually. That was that from the, is that a USDA grant through the feds? It's through the uh, T NTIA, the National Telecommunications okay. Information Administration. Um, so that gets us, you know, to 450 million, but we don't want to stop there. You know, we want to try to get, so we're working, um, you know, I, um, I can't say at this point, but we do think there's another op uh, opportunity for another 100 million. The reason I don't want to say it is because I don't want other people to be going after it. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a so we're, we're, our goal is to get this fully grant funded so we can drive the cost, so we can drive, you know, make it more affordable. So, and Christine, just to be clear, when you talk about 100% grant funded, that's for the construction. That's for the construction. You, that's where you get down to that issue that you've got operation maintenance, customer care costs that, you know, that we that, uh, really because, become a challenge. Right. And, and we should make it clear that even though this process is going to be grant funded and it is being put through a structure that's very much like a municipality, the service won't be free. To customers at the end of the day there will be like a monthly charge just like for your phone or for your your cell phone or whatever correct well, I think yeah, probably the easiest equivalent for folks um would be you know your water and if you live in a town with water infrastructure um i don't have that at my house and i don't well i don't think any of the three of us have that at our houses but lots of people in vermont live somewhere with water infrastructure and so the idea is that government funding funded that build out of that water infrastructure, but you're still paying um, a specific bill each month for the water that is coming to your house. It's a little different because you don't like have a choice about a different water provider. Um, but I think it's, it's that combination of like you have trust in government, there's bonding ability to build that out further if needed, but you're still paying for the service um, with a monthly bill. Great, thank you for that clarification, appreciate it. Um, oh, I had a, when you were talking, Christine, I had a question and it just went right out of my head. I well, I'm glad sorry. that happens to you. I keep, I, I, keep <laughs> I keep thinking it's age related for me, but it, uh, that I like to believe that I did that when I was younger too, but. <laughs> um, so I oh here it is. I, I know we want to talk a little bit about some things that are happening at the national level. But before we do, um, I'd love to touch base with both you, Christine, and you, Emily. You know, I do think it has been extraordinary how the CUD process went from a bunch of very committed volunteers to slowly becoming a much more like focused, regu not regulated, but policy-driven, professionalized process. And I think there have been some bumps in the road, but it also seems very Vermont to me how we did that. What, have either of you had a chance to kind of sit back and look at lessons learned um, about how this process grew and, and how we support maybe other processes like this or CUDs who are coming online now? Well, I'll just tell you, like anything else, I, I, I'm not sure I can talk about um, I think things have gone, uh, uh, you know, very well. Uh, but of course, you know, at my career, I've, I've, I've seen so much happen and that, you know, I'm comparing it to other things I've seen this, you know, I give this an A plus 
<laughs> you know, you know can, things ha- can things have done happen better? Of course they could. But boy, I, I, this, I'm giving this an A+. Plus. Uh, <laughs> the, so, but I will say that, you know, we have to be careful. And that's my job is to moderate expectations. You know, that, one of the things that, uh, one of the things that, that we have found uh, to, that every, that, so when I talk about the different speeds that the CUDs are operating at, the reason is because some of those CDs have ideals that don't match reality. You know, mm. so we talk, it's so funny because I spent hours with the federal treasury trying to educate them on this issue. You know, they, they talk about open access and competition. I'm like, holy cow, we, you know, we're talking eight passings per mile. I, you know, nobody's going to serve that area. You don't even talk about open access and competition. Let's talk about getting people served, right? So, so the the CUDs that have been slower because their boards are fighting over this issue, which if they understood the math and the numbers, they would not even discuss it. You know, it's but that's mm-hmm. the difference between the policy making and the boots on the ground reality. You know, I I always you know I would say math is the is the language of the universe. Let's all talk about the math, but not not everybody likes to talk about it. Oh, that. I love that. <laughs> or, um, you know, I've been really, there's a few things that I've sort of noticed through this process. Um, one is that the whole thing started in a lot of ways because there was one collection of communities in Vermont who, you know, a decade ago started doing something innovative. Um, and it was communities with really a tremendous amount of resources to innovate with. Yeah. Right. Mm. Um, so it's really was like a collection of some of our wealthier towns in the state that came together to do this um, and did it with like very much, you know, we have more worker co-ops and consumer co-ops in this state than I think anywhere else in the country. And so we really do have this like cultural, you know, I don't want to do the Iran exceptionalism thing. I tend to stay away from that, but we really do have sort of an exceptional practice in Vermont of that sort of collaborative business model being a reasonable thing to think about. Um, And so there was like that local innovation, that local excitement in a very resource rich area. And I don't wanna discount that. Like it could not have happened in a community that was not as incredibly resource rich as the communities that came together to do it the first time. Um, And then once that was sort of successful, once it was piloted, we had policymakers who were able to see that like this was successful. It's a fairly nonpartisan issue. Like I think there's a lot of places where we see market failure in meeting people's needs. And I think I have an easier time seeing those market failures than perhaps someone who's in a different place on the political spectrum than I am. Um, But in the case of broadband, I think there's really like, it was such an dream market failure in Vermont that I think it was really easy to see. Like this is actually a place where government must intervene or we're never gonna get somewhere. And we were able, there was even sort of the opportunity to test out like maybe we could just subsidize this for corporations and see that fail and fail spectacularly. Mm -hmm. And so there were all these sort of opportunities over the last 15 years to both see what worked and to test out all of the possible other things that didn't work. And so we came into the sort of policy making process around the communications union districts with pretty broad, broad agreement about what would work and what wouldn't because we had such clear and stark examples in Vermont. We had a few really sort of le- a few legislators who were super clear and regular on that. Um, we had a lot of community calls to have something happen really sort of across income spectrums, which matters. Um, And so I think all of that coming together helped. It's also one of the interesting things. So, you know, citizen legislature, no technical knowledge of anything. Um, And so sometimes that can be very helpful because it keeps us from sort of getting too into the interfering weeds, right? Mm -hmm. Um, With things like say schools, everyone sort of touched a school at some point. So all legislators feel like they know everything about schools, right? Whereas with something like super complicated, especially with an older legislator, people are like, I don't know what the internets are. And so it makes it a little easier for us to sort of trust technical expertise when we have some of those policy conversations. Mm. Um, 
there were certainly like some bumps along the road around um, being technology agnostic, what speed was reasonable to ask for, what future planning looked like. I think Christine, you were like a very clear voice um, through a lot of that process. We also had the opportunity of like, you know, a large gubernatorial campaign to be talking about this on the regular. I mean, it was like a part of your platform in a way that a lot of issues aren't usually. Yeah. And so that really helped too. So like we had the, you know, we had the media attention, we had someone going around, you know, we don't usually have that level of road show on a major policy issue in Vermont either. And so there's like a lot of really cool things that came together, I think, to make this happen with the right people, the right failures, the right successes, the right opportunities. And then flood of federal money at just the right moment, right? So we set up the communication mm -hmm. districts. We kind of thought it was going to take forever with just Vermont money. And we were able to be like perfectly positioned at the moment that the federal flood of money came. So that's another just like really good that led to good results. Yeah, well said. And I'll, I'll just say another thing to add to, I, I know we're getting short on time, but I'll just quickly touch on the national telecom issues and how they impact Vermont, you know? So thank you. It, so, you know, I, uh, telecom, I think of Charlie Brown and the football, right? With, uh, you know, <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what's her name? Uh, Lucy. Kept, Lucy kept pulling the football away, right? That's what the telecom companies have done at the federal level. You know, if you look at the national telecom act, 1996, I think it was, they, they, uh, they promised if they if we just deregulate it, we'll get everybody covered. And said, oh, okay, we'll deregulate. That happened to the national. Then in 2004, they kind of said, well, you're, you're not doing it. Yet. Oh, just give us more time. Just give us more time, right? So it took a while to figure out that, you know, for folks in a nonpartisan way to come to what Emily was talking about, to that market failure. You know, it took, it because of the intense lobbying, and that intense lobbying continues to this day at the federal level. Um, the good news is we have the state broadband's leaders network that, you know, we've now created some power to fight them. And that's one of my personal top priorities is to be part of that fight to not let the telecom providers, you know, uh, sink this effort. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Christine. Um, that is unfortunately all the time we have today for today's show. Uh, but I'm sure we will be talking about CUDs and uh, rural internet again, because it is such a big topic here in Vermont. So Christine Hallquist, Executive Director of the Vermont Community Broadband Board. Thank you so much for joining us today. If people wanna find more information or if there's um, any websites out there that you think are really good at explaining this issue further, uh, any you would like to suggest? Oh yes, I think the NTIA, the National, uh, t uh, just NTIA.org, I think it is, but anyway, just Google National Telecommunications Information Administration. I think they're doing a marvelous job in terms of working these issues and there's a lot of information on the website. Fantastic, thank you. Emily, if people need to find more information on you. Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org and you will find links to all the ways to get in touch with me as well as all of my various social media accounts where you can get regular updates as well as sign up for my newsletter. Wonderful. And as always, the Montpelier Happy Hour airs on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station, every Friday at 2. You can also find us wherever you find your podcasts on BCTV and many of the peg stations around Vermont. We want to do a big thank you to BCTV for helping us get our YouTube videos out there. And hey, everyone, have a great weekend. Thank you. <laughs>